Hello, everyone. Um, I am Mary Flowers. Um, welcome to the uh, second uh, GVHD Interact Provide Network. I have been. I will be joined by Dr. Betty Hamilton, Associate Professor at the um, Cl uh, Clinic Cleveland Clinic, and also we will be joined by Dr. Andrew Trunk, which is a hematology oncology, also from the Cleveland Clinic. I'm having a little problem of advancing. Okay. So as I said, welcome to the second eco program of the GVHD Interactive Provider Network. Uh, the goal of this um, uh, session is to connect with GVHD specialists um, in community uh, providers to share expertise and discuss case and improve patient um, care. This network is based on an extension for community healthcare outcomes called ECO, which is, has been proven to be useful for learning techniques and interactive video technology to connect community providers with specialists. The session is designed around a case based and mentorship, and will help the primary care and other uh, uh, community based uh, providers to gain practice expertise required to care for patients with GVHD. And the questions and comments for the learners will be encouraged to facilitate the discussion. The target audience is shown here. It's for physicians with or all specialities, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and the other healthcare providers, professionals, nursing, uh, who treat patients with chronic GVHD. The education objective is shown here. After the completion of this program, you'll be able to have learn review of the systems and how to screen for chronic GVHD, to determine when to start and how to manage it, uh, uh, GVHD of mucocutaneous presentation, and to discuss options regarding other strategy of systemic treatment as well as late effects uh, related to this complication of the allogeneic transplant. Here's the program. Um, uh, we will have a didactic presentation by Dr. Betty Hamilton, followed by a case presentation. And we'll have a questions and the answer and panel discussion regarding the case and any other questions that the uh, audience might have. And we're going to give you some close announcements. Fact to disclosure Dr. Steve Pavlatek is the chair and planner for this network, uh, and he has no disclosure. I, here is my disclosures for you to read. Here is the uh, Dr. Betty Hamilton had disclosures, and the Dr. Andrew Frank, who has no relevant financial disclosure about this talk. And the, this activity is um, uh, a sponsor. Uh, by the organized by the uh, Plasca Nima and MDS Foundation, which part and organize of the GVHD Interact Provider. So this is um, uh, a program that has this, as well as the uh, Meredith Cowell and the National Institute of Marrow Transplant with the NEDGE. This is an education uh, program uh, that has the intent to quality improvements we will be recording these sessions, which is good because the participant can um, see those uh, um, uh, program video later. And if you have any questions or concerns, please uh, send your email to GVHD network at aamds.org. Some helpful uh, tips, this is uh, housekeeping things. We encourage you to keep your camera on during the program so we can see you. Please mute your microphone when not speaking. Um, to ask any questions or comments, you can raise your hands on camera or you can raise your hand in the icon in the reaction section at the bottom of your screen. Speak clearly and state your name when you speak or you say uh, in the comment and what is the institution 
or practice before you start new questions so we know where are you from and what is you um, identify you more. You may also get, get check the function to submit comments or questions. So with further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Betty Hamilton to start the program with a didactic session. All right. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, just had to figure out how to unmute myself. Um, but I'm really excited to be here today. I'm, um, this is a great initiative to be able to um, overview some different aspects of chronic graft versus host disease and be able to share um, and discuss cases. Um, so um, I will be giving, um, as Mary said, this uh, first portion to discuss um, mucocutaneous uh, chronic graft versus host disease. So while we all know that chronic GVHD can affect many different organ simps, um, systems, over the next 15 to 20 mi minutes or so, I'll be focusing specifically on the three more common manifestations of mucocutaneous GVHD. Specifically, I'm gonna be going over signs, symptoms, um, how to screen, diagnose, and manage ocular graft-versus-host disease, oral GVHD, and genital GVHD. Other manifestations of GVHD, such as skin um, and other highly morbid forms like lungs, they will be covered in other sessions in the future. In the second half of this session, uh, Dr. Trunk, one of our hematology oncology fellows here at the Cleveland Clinic will be presenting a case and will be able to discuss our approaches to diagnosis and management of mucocutaneous GVHD. So chronic GVHD is of course uh, the leading cause of late morbidity and mortality after allogeneic transplant. Despite continued advances in transplant, such as approaches in donor selection, conditioning, our GVHD prevention methods, and other supportive care, the incidence of chronic GVHD continues to be quite high, affecting up to 50% of transplant recipients. Chronic GVHD and its treatment, which often consists of prolonged immunosuppressive therapy, such as steroids, increases the risk of other complications, such as infections, other organ toxicities, poor quality of life, and um, ultimately decreased survival. Chronic GBHD often affects many mucosal sites, An early and an accurate diagnosis of GBHD in conjunction with intervention is key to minimizing patient discomfort, um, also helps prevent irreversible organ damage and um, functional deficits. In transplant patients, GBHD must be distinguished from other causes of mucosal inflammation and discomfort including medication effects, infection, and malignancy, which we'll review. Careful surveillance of mucosal sites is really key to prevent, detect, and manage GVHD and other complications of transplant. So let's first talk about ocular graft-versus-host disease. Eye chronic GVHD has been reported to affect approximately 35% of transplant recipients. Among those with chronic GVHD, the eyes have been reported to be the third most common organ involved, affecting half of patients at the time of GVHD diagnosis. And often these patients are already presenting with moderate or severe eye scores by NIH criteria. A little background um, for those of us who are ophthalmologists um, and ocular specialists on just the areas of the eye that may be affected by graft-versus-host disease. You can see here um, that the tear film is really composed of three layers and deficiencies in any of these layers are seen in patients with chronic GVHD. Ocular GVHD may be characterized by at least three important biologic processes. This is lacrimal gland dysfunction, meibomian gland dysfunction, and corneal conjunctival inflammation. Similar to chronic graft-versus-host disease of other sites, the initial phase of ocular GVHD is thought to be a T-cell mediated inflammatory process with a subsequent phase that's a result of a cascade of immune effects leading to fibrotic changes in the glands, as well as ineffective tear film um, causing a lot of surface damage on the eye. The ducts and lacrimal glands um, are preferentially targeted by these immune cells and other inflammatory cells in this initial phase and ducts um, of the glands and nasal lacrimal ducts are frequently blocked and obstructed by fibrosis. Other potential affected areas include the cornea, limbus, and conjunctiva. So 
Ocular GVHD can thus affect really almost every structure of the eye. Chronic GVHD may be described as keratoconjunctivitis sicca, which is basically dry eye from loss of tear film. Um, punctate keratitis, which is corneal inflammation or damage, and cicatrial conjunctivitis or inflammation and subsequent scarring of the conjunctiva. These have all been described in chronic graft versus host disease. Blepharitis is also described, which is inflammation of eyelids, which can lead to the um, ingrowth of eyelashes, which subsequently can damage the cornea and scratch the cornea. Um, these images here really demonstrate scarring and damage. Um, damage. Um, ophthalmologists use fluorescent dye, and the scarring can be seen in these top two pictures. This bottom picture shows scarring of the ocular mucosa when the eyelid is flipped up. Patients who present with ocular GVHD can complain of several symptoms, including eye irritation, burning, pain and redness, um, sensitivity to light, blurry vision, a sensation of sand or grit in the eyes, um, loss of eyelashes, and paradoxically, their first symptoms may actually be excessive tearing rather than dryness. It's of course important to distinguish ocular GVHD from other potential causes of inflammation and irritation, including infection, um, certain drugs can affect the eyes, trauma, allergies, chemical irritants, um, as well as corneal abrasions from scratches or other causes. Per NIH diagnostic criteria, there are actually no specific diagnostic signs of ocular GVHD, but several distinctive signs that may overlap with other causes. It's thus important to partner closely with an ophthalmologist who may be able to do a more thorough evaluation and examination of the eyes. So you can see here, there are several evaluation measures that exist. The Shermer's test is one that can be performed relatively easy in the office by placing a folded Shermer paper strip um, on the one third lower lid margin to measure the length of wetting after a period of five minutes. Not all offices, of course, have, especially in an oncology or hematology office, um, not necessarily have the capability of doing this. Um, and again, it's important to sort of partner with an ophthalmologist um, as this test is often deferred to them. Um, the ODSI or Ocular Surface Disease Index is actually a patient recorded out reported outcome assessment um, that's related to dry eyes. It's been used in many GVHD trials with very high specificity. These other important valuations down here, such as slit lamp examination, are really require the expertise of an ophthalmologist um, and are often done in the office. The 2014 NIH criteria define a simple symptom-based diagnosis of ocular GVHD. Severity is defined as a score of zero to three based on the type of supported care required for the eyes and the effect of the symptoms on function and activities of daily living. This is an overview of, of what one consider one might consider potentially stepwise management of ocular GVHD. Really can start with optimizing the general environment, ensuring that a patient stays hydrated, thus the eyes stay hydrated, avoiding irritants, keeping eyes protected, and limit things um, that would dry the eyes out, such as limiting screen time and things like that. The next step really is improving lubrication with things like preservative free artificial tears and other ointments that can be used at nighttime that can help lubricate the eye. Tear preservation is a very common um, way to approach management of ocular GVHD. Um, this can be uh, done twofold by decreasing tear, tear evaporation, by increasing the oil layer. Um, ophthalmologists often recommend things like warm compresses, good eyelid hygiene, um, and sometimes fish oil supplements, again, to increase that oil layer. Um, another approach is of tear preservation is um, by reducing drainage of tears by using things like punctal plugs. And if those are effective, permanent punctal cauterization that help um, keep the tears within the um, eye chambers. Further local therapy to reduce inflammation include things like steroid drips, um, cyclosporin drops, and lifidigest drops. These are all things to um, help lubricate the eyes as well as uh, decrease inflammation. Additional surface support include things like autologous serum tears and scleral lenses. And sometimes ocular GVHD does require a more systemic approach with systemic therapies, of course, like corticosteroids, as well as some of the other newer therapies we have, um, which we'll re review briefly later. So moving on to oral chronic graft versus host disease, 
Oral and perioral GVHD has been reported in up to 80% of patients with chronic GVHD. It's often present at diagnosis and is the most common location of a single site disease. Although oral, although oral chronic GVHD may not necessarily be um, independently associated with mortality, it's, it's a very significant cause of morbidity and patient um, um, discomfort. Oral chronic GVHD is characterized um, by mucosal disease, salivary gland disease, um, and sclerosis. The sclerosis portion we'll only briefly touch on as it will be um, covered in more of a sclerotic um, session. Patients presenting with oral chronic GVHD will complain of sensitivity and pain, dry mouth, uh, changes in taste. Um, particularly, they can uh, complain of inability to eat spicy, salty, or acidic foods, um, sometimes carbonated beverages, as it tends to burn their mucosa. Uh, they can also complain of sensation of dryness, um, a stickiness or roughness in their mouth. Uh, they can also report bubbles or blisters in their mouth that can pop. Um, those with uh, perioral GVHD can complain of dry, painful, chapped lips. Um, and then those with sclerosis um, can have restricted mouth opening. On exam, patients will present with lichenoid changes, hyperkeratotic plaques, um, erythema and ulceration, as well as these mucoceles, which are seen up here, um, as well as lip cracking, um, erythema of the lips. They oftentimes can have poor dentition with um, often chipped teeth and a lot of uh, dental caries. As with ocular GVHD, it's really important to distinguish oral GVHD from other conditions. Herpes simplex viral infection um, is a common one that um, can occur even uh, with breakthrough infections despite antiviral prophylaxis. They can present a solitary or multiple ulcerative lesions. Um, it's rare, but uh, certain medications can sometimes cause abscess-like ulcers. Um, this can be seen with sirolimus therapy. Um, other benign conditions like linea alba, uh, changes, other changes associated with cheek biting, um, and geographic tongue should also not be mistaken for graft-versus-host disease. It's also very important to note that patients with oral GVHD can be at increased risk for developing oral squamous cell carcinoma. This can definitely present with ulceration, and really um, in a someone who has bad GVHD, that can be difficult to distinguish from um, changes of mucosal uh, GVHD. So although it's important to biopsy any of these suspicious lesion, lesions, it's actually um, rare or, or not necessarily required uh, to get a biopsy to diagnose oral graft-versus-host disease. Diag diagnosis often um, relies on history and clinical exam findings. Uh, per NIH criteria, diagnostic features include lichenoid changes, hyperkeratotic plaques, um, whilst supporting distinctive features can include erythema and other ulcerative changes. Severity, again, per NIH criteria is defined on a zero to three scale based on symptoms and functional impairment. Um, management of oral chronic GVHD can provide it into general care of uh, the general oral mucosa, uh, spot treatment of focal lesions, and then uh, general agents to help with xerostomia or dry mouth, um, such as salivary stimulants, um, as you can see all summarized on this table. Topical corticosteroids are really the mainstay of therapy and can be very effective in reducing mucosal inflammation. Um, it's important that they can be very effective when used correctly. Um, many patients are not, um, uh, are not aware that they have to use these diligently and rinse for a very prolonged period of time. Patients with oral chronic GVHD are also at high risk of um, cavities, infections such as candidiasis, and um, of course, oral cancers as well. Attention to good oral hygiene, regular dental follow-up, um, identification and management of infections, and of course, the prompt recognition and biopsy of any suspicious lesions are all important considerations in patients with oral chronic GVHD and long-term management of patients with GVHD. Lastly, I'm going to briefly overview genital chronic GVHD. Uh, the incidence of genital chronic GVHD has been re reported to, to be anywhere from 25 to 50 percent, depending on um, which study you look at. The true incidence of genital the estimated as patients tend to underreport or ignore symptoms and sexual problems. 
Sometimes they're a little bit embarrassed to talk to um, their providers about their symptoms. Many patients may have concurrent involvement of other sites of mucocutaneous GVHD, particularly oral GVHD, although genital GVHD has been described in the literature as the only site of chronic graft versus host disease. Patients with genital GVHD complain of dryness, itching, burning. Uh, they can have pain with urination or intercourse, and sometimes um, with more severe cases, typically bleeding. Similar to other mucocutaneous manifestations of chronic graft versus host disease, it's important to distinguish genital GVHD from other diagnosis. Um, most commonly, and in particular, this is infection or estrogen deficiency. Thus, um, this is another um, area of mucocutaneous GVHD where close collaboration and partnership um, with a specialist is important. So a gynecologist who um, is, is able to or is familiar with GVHD is, is really essential as they can do a careful exam and they can distinguish the mucosal changes between um, the different entities. So thus on exam, which again is typically done with an experienced gynecologist or hopefully um, optimally done with an experienced gynecologist, will demonstrate things like erythema of the vulva, mucosal erosion, sclerotic changes, and scarring. Um, some of these changes, particularly the webs, rings, um, the sclerosis, are diagnostic changes per NIH criteria, while other diagnoses can present as erosions, fissures, and ulcers. It's important to briefly note that genital GVHD may affect males um, as well and can cause lichenoid changes, um, phimosis, contractures, um, stenosis, and strictures. Also can uh, cause pain and dysfunction. Collaboration with urology and or dermatology can also be um, helpful in, in um, diagnosing and managing male genital GVHD. Once again, severity per NIH grading are based on signs and symptoms reported by the patient um, as seen here. Um, again, a score from zero to three. Um, general hygiene, consideration for estrogen deficiency, topical immunosuppression, these are the mainstays of management for genital GVHD. Early recognition of vaginal GVHD is critical to avoid the need for um, more invasive and intensive um, interventions, such as the need for surgery for late complications, such as strictures, agglutination, and uh, closure of the uh, vaginal canal. So in the last part of this talk, I just want to briefly review the role for systemic therapies in mucocutaneous graft-versus-host disease, um, particularly um, we now have three FDA-approved therapies, which of course include ibrutinib, ruxolitinib, and belumosidil. Um, ibrutinib, of course, was approved based on an open-label multi-centered uh, study in steroid refractory chronic graft-versus-host disease. Um, data on specific organ responses is limited, but um, as you can see from this table, a high sustained response rate of 88% um, was noted in patients with oral involvement. Um, other muc mucocutaneous involvement was not, um, was not reported. Ruxolitinib was approved based on a phase three study, randomizing um, ruxolitinib with best, to best available therapy, uh, demonstrating favorable response rates of 45% in ocular GVHD, 43% uh, in genital GVHD, and 52% in oral GVHD, all favoring ruxolitinib um, compared to best available therapy. And then um, finally, we have belumosidol, which was approved based on a phase two study in steroid refractory chronic graft versus host disease. This, also, this agent also demonstrated very favorable response rates in oral and ocular GVHD um, of 55% in oral GVHD and 42% in ocular GVHD. This overall demonstrating that some organ specific responses were indeed seen with the systemic therapy, and there is a role for systemic therapy even beyond steroids for um, mucocutaneous GBHD. So, in sum summary, ocular, oral, and genital GBHD are really common manifestations of chronic GBHD. Prompt recognition of signs and symptoms are critical to minimize um, symptoms, discomfort, um, as well as uh, more. Uh, significant organ damage and functional impairment. 
Um, and signs and symptoms can be very responsive to aggressive topical therapies, but there still remains a role for systemic therapy um, in these in, in mucocutaneous GBHD. All right, so we can now move on to the case presentation. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Andrew Trunk. I'll be presenting today's case. Uh, so here we have a 48-year-old female who was diagnosed with AML, uh, monosomy 7. She's in a CR1 and was consolidated with an allo stem cell transplant. Uh, she received an HLA-matched unrelated donor, DP non-permissive, um, the stem cell source being growth factor mobilized peripheral cells. She received a myeloablative conditioning regimen with uh, PSI TBI, and uh, her GVHD prophylactic strategy was uh, tacro and methotrexate. She engrafted with no evidence of disease. Um, she did have early post-transplant uh, acute GVHD, which was biopsy proven. Uh, this was overall grade two. Um, clinical skin was stage two, uh, and upper GI was stage one. This was managed with topical steroid cream, oral beclomethasone, and budesonide, uh, and she achieved a complete response with this treatment. She does well. She's discharged from the early post-transplant service on day plus 100 uh, to return back to her local primary provider. Um, she remains on her tapering dose, uh, tapering dose of Tacro. On day plus 150, uh, she comes to clinic reporting new oral dryness and a cotton mouth sensation. Dr. Hamilton, what would you do next for our patient? So, um, of course, when a patient um, who, in the setting of tapering immunosuppression, um, begins to complain of, of um, a new symptom, uh, particularly oral dryness, uh, we get uh, suspicious or concerned about um, chronic the development of chronic graft-versus-host disease. So, uh, when a patient presents to clinic, it's important to, of course, get a full history um, so sim uh, similar to things that I talked about in the presentation to um, elicit more of a, a history about her oral symptoms, whether she's sensitive to medications, where she's noticed any um, new soreness, if, um, um, if she has any other symptoms. In addition, if you have one site of chronic graft-versus-host disease, it's obviously important to screen for many different sites of chronic GVHD. So we'll want to make sure get a good history of, um, you know, if she has any dry eyes or any other manifestations or symptoms of chronic GVHD, skin changes and things like that. And then of course, a thorough exam as well. We wanna take a good uh, look in her mouth um, uh, and do a whole uh, chronic graft versus host disease assessment. And then of course, evaluate labs as well. Anything else to add, Mary, or anybody else? Yeah, no, I think you, you cover very well. I think another thing as part of the review of the system that you say, it's very important. Uh, it's also important to, to inquire if the patient has, for any reason, let's say this is a springtime and the patient feels that she has allergies between cold and then she may have started to use some antihistaminics, which can also lead to, to dryness. So just to be complete, to inquire about other potential cause of dry eye, dry eyes, Absolutely. I mean, dry mouth. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. All right. So on further questioning, she reports that her mouth burns when she brushes her teeth with regular toothpaste. Uh, she's been unable to eat tomato sauce or drink carbonated beverages uh, because these tend to burn her mouth. She reports that her eyes have been tearing excessively. Um, she denies any new medications. Importantly, she has no skin rashes or skin changes, no joint stiffness, uh, no shortness of breath or cough. Uh, and additionally, she reports that she has no genital symptoms at this time. Uh, what would you expect to see on her physical exam? So 
specifically um, in her mouth, um, it's uh, oftentimes we will see some what we call lichenoid changes or a white lacy pattern on the buccal mucosa. Um, I always make sure that I have a really good, strong light. Um, sometimes people use um, their iPhone light. Um, the role of a more yellow light, like the otoscope light is also important as it can sort of reveal more erythema, but she might have erythema. I'm also looking for ulcerations um, and potential mucosal, mu mucosal. So all these are potential signs of um, oral chronic graft versus host disease. Oftentimes, I don't necessarily see anything on an ocular exam. You know, as a hematologist in our office, we're not doing any, you know, major ocular evaluation. I do sometimes notice that patients will have um, tearing, sometimes they'll have some mild erythema of their conjunctiva. Um, sometimes it looks like they're a little bit light sensitive, but otherwise, um, from my standpoint, the ocular exams are generally fairly benign. Um, and then, um, of course, we'll do a full um, exam to evaluate her skins and her joints, but it sounds like from her report that she might not have any of those changes. Anything else to add from anyone? No, I think that you cover everything. Uh, I... <clears throat> Okay, um, so on her exam, she has no conjunctival erythema, no other notable eye findings on the basic bedside exam. Uh, her oral mucosa does demonstrate lichenoid changes um, on the bilateral buccal mucosa uh, with areas of erythema uh, and a few mucosils on her palate. Um, she, uh, the rest of her exam is unremarkable. The weight is stable. Uh, she does have on her laboratory studies some mild liver enzyme elevation uh, with a normal t bilirubin and ALKFOS of 160, an AST of 75, and an ALT of 80. Uh, at this point, what would you recommend for her? So she, um, it, it seems as though she has um, mostly just oral graft versus host disease. Um, and um, the, this is oftentimes very responsive to topical therapies. Um, and so my first go-to for oral GBHD, and she's, she's already demonstrating some diagnostic signs of graft-versus-host disease. Um, and so my first go-to tends to be dexamethasone rinses. Um, these are... Um, uh, basically, it, it's important to sort of tell her that to uh, rinse three times a day, three to four times a day. Um, it should stay in her mouth for a good five minutes. I tell patients to sort of set a timer next to their sink um, and to remember to spit it out too because you don't want to ingest that much dexamethasone. Um, and in regards to her liver enzyme abnormalities, um, I would make sure to that at this point they're mild, but would continue to, to monitor them at this point. I think it's also important as she does see signs of graft versus host disease that she gets referred to ophthalmology given her um, initial findings of excess tearing as that can be an early sign of chronic graft versus host disease. Um, and uh, she should also have lung function testing as well as that would be important to um, make sure that we're screening for the rest of chronic graft versus host disease. I think that another important thing that you said, uh, Dr. Hamilton, is the fact that, uh, you know, asymptomatic and pulmonary function test can detect early lung GVHD and, and the patients may be completely asymptomatic. And the, the, the risk of, of lung GVHD is highest in people with chronic GVHD. Does the importance that these events, so once you diagnose a patient with chronic GVHD, even if it's mild, it's important to look for other uh, assessments and evaluation, which does include, of course, the pulmonary function test and refer to an ophthalmology in this case. Another just little thing to think about when we examine this patient, 
is that when I look at these lace-like changes, which can be underneath the tongue, can be in the lip, the surface of the lip, can be inside of the lip, can be in the gingiva sometimes. So it's important to use gloves because then you should stretch the buccomucosa to see if those lace-like goes away because in chronic GVHD, they, they, they do not uh, go away when you stretch the mucosa. So two lessons to take home, use it lighting, because if you use a flashlight, a common yellow light, you may miss the lichenoid changes. And so the blue light from uh, you know, Android phones or iPhone is kind of nice to look for the white changes while the yellow light is important to detect more the degree of the erythema and look more for ulcers. So those two components of the light is very relevant when examining patients with potential oral GVHD. I think I saw something on in the chat. Um, I, I, I don't know if one of you can see it better since I'm screen sharing. <laughs> Okay. Yes. So the chat question, um, should the patient have a gynecologic exam at this point, although not currently reporting symptoms? I think I th that, go ahead, Mary. Yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, this, this is a good question. I mean, if you have a gynecologist you should probably go and, and send the patient to the gynecology as well. Because especially if the patient is not sexually active, they may have some changes there that it's not symptomatic yet, but it has the lichenoid changes. The difficult sometimes when you have these patients in the, in the uh, community, it takes time to refer. So it might be a good idea to be thinking about referral to make sure that the patient is well estrogenized uh, because also hypogonadism can lead to some of the changes that can be required dilation later. So I think it's a common practice uh, to have the patient be seen by a gynecology within the first three months. And the, um, if the that, if you are de developing, if you have a patient with it or GVHD, probably is not a bad idea. I just don't know the timing. Maybe not in this in this moment here, but if you have a problem regarding referring the patient, you should start to refer because it may take two, two months to get that gynecology examined or not. And I actually see that Dr. Goji, who's one of our gynecologists that we do work with here at Cleveland Clinic, was actually able to join. So I don't know, Dr. Goji, if you do have any thoughts to add to that. Yeah, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I was enjoying the talk. Um, I agree with Mary, and it's a very important question. Um, I think all patients should be referred to a gynecologist at some point, even when they're asymptomatic. There is evidence that when women have vaginal issues, if you don't ask them, they don't easily like report that to you. And from our clinic here, Betty, I will tell you that some patients tell me they feel so grateful that they are doing well, that they don't want to bother anybody with gynecologic concerns. So sometimes they have those concerns, but they feel in the grand scheme of things is a little discomfort that they can live with. So it's really important that you ask these patients if they... Um, if they have any symptoms. And as Mary said, they might say no because they are not sexually active. And um, maybe they never thought about it. The other thing is to ask them if they're using any over-the-counter. If the other might say she's asymptomatic or maybe using over-the-counter um, feminine products um, that makes them feel better. Like benzocaine containing feminine products might stop the itching and burning, but does not you know, help treat GVHD. So that's another way to go around it, to ask if they're using any feminine products. Thank you so much. And in the same line, in terms of having referred to a gynecology, it's also, it's, when a patient comes to you with or GVHD, the most, it's also important to look at the glands of the penis in the patient also. I mean, to see if there is any lichenoid there because they also are not gonna necessarily 
report to you. So who went to look at the, the GI, the genitalia, the oral mucosa usually is associated with the mucosa alteration of these other areas. In other words, if you have a GYN involvement, most likely you have oral. And if you have uh, uh, lichen or changes involving the penis areas, you likely also had oral. So the oral triggers me to be thinking about these other mucosa areas to examine. Great. Okay. All right, uh, so our patient is prescribed dexamethasone rinses. Uh, she's instructed to take five milliliters uh, with the instructions Dr. Hamilton mentioned to rinse for five minutes and spit and do this three to four times a day. She's instructed to avoid alcohol-based rinses and to use a soft toothbrush uh, with regular dental evaluation recommended. Uh, she's scheduled for PFTs and set up with ophthalmology. Uh, who does a Schirmer's test, which Dr. Hamilton described earlier in the slit lamp examination, um, with a report coming back as keratoconjunctivitis sicca. Uh, they recommend preservative-free artificial tears and restasis. Fortunately, her PFTs are stable. At this time, she remains on low-dose tacro at subtherapeutic levels in the setting of her taper. Uh, she asks you if she should remain on her tacro. What do you tell her? So this is a, a great question, which I'm not sure there's necessarily a right answer for. Um, and I have to admit that sometimes, you know, I don't necessarily have a standard for this and, and my practice might vary a little bit between patient um, and patient, uh, patient to patient. So, um, you know, I, I would at this, at this point likely increase her dose of tacrolimus to a therapeutic le level. Um, the GVHD, we know that tacrolimus is not an ideal chronic GVHD treatment, but this did occur while she was on a tapering dose. If she as was otherwise tolerating the tacro fine and she has, you know, no renal dysfunction or wasn't having any other side effects to the TACRO, I would typically increase it, try to increase it back up to therapeutic to see if that would, might help her symptoms at all. Um, but again, knowing that TACRO is not a, a necessarily um, a good treatment for chronic GBHD, I think it's reasonable to consider another treatment um, instead of the tacrolimus. Any thoughts, Mary? No, I think that you, uh cover uh, well. There is a question regarding um, topical agency difference between lichenoid versus sclerotic. So I thought that maybe we can keep these questions to answer when we go more over the gynecological evaluation of this patient. Okay. Okay, so the patient returns for follow-up at day plus 200. Uh, she reports she had initial improvement in oral symptoms with the dex rinses, but became lax. And uh, when she ran out, she didn't refill it. Recently is uh, intermittently restarted, but still having symptoms. Um, she was unable to use the restasis as it burned. Uh, her eyes continue to be dry and feel like they have sand in them. Uh, she doesn't necessarily have any new symptoms at this time. However, she is wearing sunglasses and reports that the lights in the office are bothering her. Uh, her oral mucosa demonstra demonstrates an increase in the erythema, uh, greater than a quarter of the mouth now, ulceration in the left buccal mucosa. Uh, she has bilateral lichenoid changes in greater than half the mouth um, with some white patchy lesions on her tongue. Uh, at this point, she's starting to lose a little bit of weight, less than 5%. Uh, and her liver enzymes are continuing to trickle up with an ALKFOS of 200, AST of 80, and an ALT of 100. Uh, Dr. Hamilton, what would you recommend next at this time? Um, so this is actually a very common scenario. I have many patients who, you know, will start out with some topical treatment, um, have some improvement, but then kind of uh, run out of their prescription for don't, and uh, you know, because they're not very symptomatic, they don't refill it. Um, I also commonly have patients sort of complain that, you know, they started with stasis, but the, it just burned too much for them to be able to use it regularly. Um, so this is a very common scenario that I see. Um, you know, I think that it's important to, um, you know, dexamethasone, since she did have a good initial response to this, 
um, is still a good medication. So I would reinforce and reemphasize that she should restart them, use them diligently for the five minutes of setting her timer about four times a day. Um, she does have a uh, singular ulcer on her buccal mucosa. So oftentimes we do use you know, a spot treatment. So in that setting, I use clobetazole gel for her to, you know, dry the area with some gauze, put a little bit of clobetazole um, on with the gauze. Um, she now has multiple organ involvement. Um, it's important for her to be referred back to ophthalmology, make sure she has follow-up with them for them to consider other treatments and other uh, localized treatments. And then her liver enzymes are beginning to increase. And I think, you know, one could potentially consider systemic therapy, but given sort of the still general mild um, elevation, oftentimes um, we'll still try to stick with topical therapy. So, you know, there is some evidence that beclomethazone, which is, is what we sometimes um, use for GI graft versus host disease, can also um, penetrate into the liver and help that. Also using supportive medicines like ursodiol for the liver as well. Um, so I, at this point, I would typically still focus on um, maximizing and optimizing uh, topical therapies. Anybody with any other thoughts? I think another question that maybe one could have is that what do we do? Is this patient is still on, uh, and maybe you present that in the previous uh, slides. Uh, it, it, what to do with the tapering dose of calcineurin inhibitors? So this patient has already VHD, the liver function test is climbing. Uh, do we continue to taper? Do we increase it to more therapeutic levels? Um, I think that there is no uh, systematic evidence base to say what to do, but in practicality, one of the things that I consider uh, is to not taper further, sometimes even increasing the dose to two levels before the rising of the liver function test happen. That's a, a clinical practice that, that I follow, but there is no right or wrong to say what should one do. I agree that I would not necessarily start a new therapy still at this point because the bilirubin is normal. This is a very good prognosis. This patient don't evolve to liver cirrhosis. The most important marker for being a bad liver GVHD that has poor outcome is based on the total bilirubin and not the transaminases. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she is instructed to restart the DEX rinses um, following those strict instructions. She's also given clobetazole um, uh, for the treatment of the ulcer using gauze. Nystatin oral rinses are added between the DEX to prevent oral thrush. Uh, she's also started on beclomethazone as well as ursodiol due to her uh, rising liver enzymes. Uh, she still is following up with ophthalmology. Um, and on her follow-up exam, um, the keratoconjunctivitis is worsening. She's got blepharitis. Um, their recommendations include steroid drops, uh, the punctal plugs, which Dr. Dr. Hamilton described, continuing use of um, preservative-free artificial tears, implementing the use of warm compresses to her eyelids, um, eyelid hygiene with baby shampoo, using moisture goggles, um, and also adding Zydra drops. At her three-month assessment, she unfortunately continues to have worsening symptoms despite the optimization of these local therapies. Her LFTs are continuing to worsen uh, despite the initiation of the beclomethasone and ursodiol. She's continuing to lose weight. Uh, the erythema and ulceration is still present in her oral mucosa. Uh, she has new uh, burning and pain in her vaginal area with an inability to have intercourse um, due to pain and discomfort. Um, her laboratory studies at this time show a T bilia of one, ALKFOS is up to 500, AST 350, and ALT 365. Uh, what are the next steps at this point? 
So it seems like we've really attempted to optimize her local therapies, at least from an ocular and oral standpoint. And, I, and again, she's starting to have more um, severe organ involvement. And so I think at this point is when we do consider systemic therapy. Um, and our, still our first line treatment is with corticosteroids. So would typically recommend um, about a half a milligram to one milligram of prednisone. Um, although the standard is one mg per kg of prednisone um, for first line treatment of chronic graft versus host disease, you know, we, we often encounter patients who we know don't tolerate steroids well. Oftentimes they have comorbidities or are older. And so um, oftentimes I do um, kind of take a look at the patient and their history and uh, whether um, to decide what dose of steroids to, to add. Um, I want to obviously for her continue to focus on optimizing uh, local therapy. So, you know, making sure she has follow up with um, the ophthalmologist for consideration of things like scleral lenses um, and um, potentially, in, you know, um, adding, for example, tacrolimus rinses for her oral mucosa to the steroid rinses. This is something that uh, we can compound at the pharmacy. Um, and then it sounds like she now is having genital symptoms. So hopefully she has established with a gynecologist, um, but that uh, make sure that she has follow up with the gynecologist at this point. Okay, so <clears throat> she continues to follow up with Optho. Uh, she has some improvements after punctal cauterization. Um, however, with pers uh, persistent symptoms, she is being fitted for scleral lenses. Uh, she's seen by Gyne and started on estrogen cream along with uh, a corticosteroid ointment. She started on a mig per kg of prednisone. Uh, she had been on tacro, as we've been discussing. However, this has stopped and cibrolimus is substituted. Um, what are your thoughts on the prednisone dose? We kind of mentioned it a little bit uh, in the last slide, uh, as well as the use of serolimus here. Yeah, so um, like I sort of mentioned, and it'd be great to um, have Mary your perspective too, but I think, you know, it really, the standard is one make per kick. However, um, in this age of, you know, being able to better optimize local therapies, to have second line, potential second line agents, um, trying to steroid spare as much as possible. It really does depend on the patient and how they've previously tolerated steroids. Um, if they have other comorbidities that will make um, adverse effects um, bad, I often do start, you know, particularly in an older, you know, someone who's older, I might start a half a mig per kg um, to see how they respond and then always have the ability to increase. Um, we also kind of briefly talked about sort of the, you know, what this, that there's really not a standard in regards to what to do with tacrolimus. Um, at this point, having increased her to a therapeutic level, I think she, it's probably not being very effective in treating any of the graft versus host disease. Sirolimus has shown um, that it can, it has more effects on Tregs and it can augment Tregs and perhaps more of a role in chronic GVHD. So this is actually a practice that I also um, do in which I will you know, substitute tacrolimus for sirolimus. Because of the time, I'm gonna let it go so we can have maybe a little bit more time for questions and answers. During that time, we can address this question regarding prednisone taper and pyrolimus uh, as well as clinical trauma. Okay, so unfortunately, the patient does have adverse uh, steroid effects with elevated sugars, weight gain, swelling, and mood lability. Uh, she wants desperately to get off of steroids, but begins flaring as soon as the prednisone is tapered. What next? So just briefly, again, I noticed that we're running short on time. Um, it, you know, alluded to in the last um, slide that we do have second line agents that do have organ specific responses. Um, I would consider one of the three agents. Again, this is, there's not a standard into what to grab for first, 
but really depends on um, the patient, their toxicities, whether they have cytopenias, um, other factors to determine what, what medicine to use next. But I would consider either ibrutinib, ruxolitinib, or velumosidil at this point. Okay, so this patient is started on uh, ruxolitinib, 10 milligrams twice a day, with an excellent response, good control over oral symptoms and uh, LFT abnormalities. She's stable. Um, the scleral lenses have worked. She's successfully weaned off of steroids. Uh, and at this point, she wants to come off of all medications. What do you tell her now? So um, I also have many, many patients who are very eager to get off medications, even if they seemingly tolerate them well, uh, they're just sort of eager to, to not feel like they need to be on something chronically. Um, the reality, however, is that I tend to be very reluctant in um, quickly weaning uh, somebody off of chronic graft versus host disease treatment. Uh, we know from studies that the you know, medium length of time of be needing to be on immunosuppression for chronic GVHD can be two to three years, depending on stem cell source. Um, and so it's, it's really important to emphasize to her that you know, we run the risk of her flaring if we taper things off too quickly. And so I always uh, try to wean people off steroids first as being the most toxic, and I sort of take it stepwise in terms of what is tapered in terms of what their sort of side effect profile is and what kind of adverse effects the patient is having. I do tend to wean uh, medications, even Ruxolinib, um, very slowly and over a long period of time. Okay, and then any other counseling for late effects of chronic GVHD? I think that maybe we are running out of time. So very briefly. Um... Sure. Um, so it's very important. We talked a little bit in the didactic session about some of the late effects like um, secondary cancers, um, more um, long-term effects of uh, cancer uh, screening. It's important to continue GVHD screening. So uh, make sure that she continues to have lung function testing um, regularly, uh, collaboration with the uh, ophthalmologist, uh, dentist, as well as gynecologist. Um, there's secondary cancers that can involve the vaginal area as well that it's important to kind of um, screen for. So there's definitely um, continued long-term follow-up that needs to be done. Um, and as we sort of slowly wean somebody from, from um, chronic graft versus host disease medications. Okay, I think we are about time. There is tons of questions that I think people have and please feel free to contact us if you have more questions. Some of the questions were related to, is there any difference between what topical therapy to use for lichenoid changes versus sclerotic lesions involving the GI, GYN? Um, I think that you know one usually uses steroids um, for both with dilation, but I would like to leave that question perhaps to answer at some point. Uh, we have a gynecology there, and if she wants to say something, maybe in one second, but I think we are running out of time. No, you're correct. There's no difference. Whether it's sclerotic or lichenoid, it's topical steroids, and some estrogen, please, for vaginal health. Okay, well, with that, thank you very much, everyone. I want to make some announcements. We have continued this uh, GVHD Interact Provide Network. This is the second one. We're going to have three, four more. The next one will be September 17. Uh, we also have other uh, education program in this uh, 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 program. Uh, all the programs here about quality of life post-transplant. We have also another announcement regarding the, the Meredith Foundation that has also some um, information and training GVHD. Yes, I, uh, a few people just need to disconnect. In case you were wondering why I appeared several times <laughs> as a <laughs> participant, <laughs> I believe the link that was sent in a reminder email 
might have been a link specific to me. And so you saw, like, it seemed like all the questions came from me, but none of them did. <laughs> oh, yeah. Actually, I, I saw some questions yeah. came from different people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, a few people renamed themselves. I, I put in the chat to do that if they were showing up as with oh, my name. Okay. But so I apologize okay. for that. But at least, you know, they those questions yeah. were not from me. <laughs> I think it went good. I mean, I think we had yes. more time. I mean, it was more interactive between the panelists, which I think it's mm -hmm. it's good. I think yes. this is the first time. Yes. And I, I think um, what's good is that these are recorded for enduring so that, you know, there'll be an, a, the more people know that this is available as a resource. I think we'll get a lot of enduring views for the recorded version, too. I think, do we have, is Mary frozen? Yeah, I think, looks <laughs> I think like you Mary. lost her. <laughs> yeah, sorry we ran yeah. short on time. We didn't have a lot of time for more discussion. That's, I think we got to the, the questions that were brought up and it was so nice that um, Dr. Goji joined us. Yes. That was the... <laughs> We hadn't touched base beforehand, so I I had uh, I wasn't sure she was joining. I didn't actually think that she was going to, but it was great that she did. Yes, yeah, that was that was a very nice uh, interaction. You know, that made me think one of the future programs after we go through this year's uh, list is something focused specifically on uh, gynecology, and she could be a you know a co presenter with someone for that yeah. one too. I'm sure she would love it. She let she mm -hmm. she enjoys it. So great. All okay, right. well, I think I think we're good. Let me see if there's any. Yep, just some thanks in the in the chat. So, and um, it, did Mary leave? Yeah, I think she did. I think Mary like, got. Okay, um, yeah. Betty, I'll send you a separate email. We we're going to need some post test questions for the enduring version. Okay. So while it's fresh in your mind, I'll send it to you in an email. But it, just a few questions that we'll use for a uh, post test for the enduring. Okay. okay. All right. Sounds good. All righty. Thank Thanks bye. again, Drew, for filling in at the last minute. <laughs> oh, not a problem. We really appreciate happy, it. Happy to participate. Yeah, it was a great, uh, great opportunity. Thank you. Great. Very good. Thank you. Bye. Have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye. You bye. too.